Good evening, everybody. We are just getting set up for tonight's Planning Vancouver Together event hosted by SFU and the City of Vancouver. Please do feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. It's great to be able to see where everybody's coming from as we get ready to talk about neighborhoods and all that they mean to our city's future and past and present. Well, what do you think, Andy? Should we start? I think um, as people start to get ready for tonight's uh, closer to home discussion, the case for complete neighborhoods, maybe we can start by um, welcoming everybody. Indeed, indeed. Hello, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to our event. And I guess we're good to start. I think, okay. Um, so I think everybody probably um, online with us tonight knows a little bit about Zoom by now. Amazingly, one year into this pandemic, so uh, this has become a bit of a lifeline for many of us. Um, we've got all kinds of opportunities to connect within this window. So you're, you've seen a few slides to show you some of the ways that we're going to um, use the Zoom to its maximum capacity in order to share ideas tonight. Um, we'll go through some of those things again. Um, but first, what I think we would like to do to start is to introduce Amanda Nahani, uh, who is a cultural facilitator from the Squamish Nation and has kindly agreed to offer us some words of welcome. Um, Amanda is uh, on the Indigenous team with Aquilini Development. Uh, and specifically assists with uh, development on Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh properties. And she also holds a number of uh, cultural, historical, educational, uh, the list goes on and on, roles um, in, uh, in her nation and in our community. Amanda. Hi. <laughs> Kayachtin ti kum kum lai. Kayachtin ti skohomish e slayotos e hamasquim o o humeo. Ye one hearts and squallowing teat seats. Wa o chit chin chin swait. Wa o chit and chop mo. Ye one heart teat seats up. Chai up. To you all respected people, welcome to Come Kum Lai. Vancouver, the Downtown area is known as Kum Kum Alight. Um, welcome to the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Feels really good in my heart to be here tonight. I also said, um, Let us carry on one heart, one mind, one spirit. Let us support another, work together, and work cooperatively with each other. It feels really good in my heart to welcome you to the traditional territories. And I would, as part of our, my welcoming, I'd like to sing a prayer song so we could start this off in a good way. And while I sing this song, you know, take some time to think of your loved ones and send them some um, prayers and think about the people, you know, who may not be having a good time right now. Maybe they're homeless or they're in the hospitals or you know, maybe they're just not able to make it out to nature. Um, you know, so let's send some prayers and let's, let's send some, you know, really good thoughts to them and to, you know, especially to all the families. And, you know, I just want to say a special prayer for everyone here, you know, through the pandemic. I pray that you're safe. I pray that you're doing well. I pray that, you know, we're going to get back to, you know, our wonderful social, socializing in the city. So this is a prayer song. And uh, we're giving thanks for everything that we have. Which goes in. 
The song is Greeting of the Day by Sahualia. Sahualia lived at Papayo, uh, which was. It feels really good in my heart. Thank you so much for taking the time to acknowledge the traditional territories. And if you can see in my background, I got these Douglas firs. And those used to be all over Vancouver. They used to be really about 30 stories high. And you know, as we we're talking about complete communities, you know, our traditional people, just to share a little bit about our, our homelands, our villages and communities. You know, we used to live in longhouses. Some people um, don't know that Northwest Coast people lived in longhouses. Um, we didn't live in teepees or igloos. So I just wanna share that. And we're, we're ocean going people. We had canoes, we had all different kinds of canoes for in the ocean and in the river and the marshes. Yeah, so thank you very much and have a wonderful night. Thank you, thank you. so much, uh, Amanda. Thank you for the, the living music and for the wisdom. I've actually, I've heard um, the longhouses in this area referred to as the, the initial multifamily housing developments in this, in this region. So thank you for all of those reminders. Thank you very much. <laughs> and next, Andy, mm -hmm. since the, the city of Vancouver is really the key motivating institution uh, for this uh, series of events, we were going to invite a representative from the city to also welcome us and, and start us off tonight. Very much so, uh, Meg, and I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Vancouver City Councillor Adrian Carr uh, to the I guess what used to be the dais is the digital dais 
and that uh, a quick bi uh, biography of uh, Councillor Carr is that she was reelected in 2018 for her third term on Vancouver City Council uh, and the Vancouver's first Green Party councillor. Uh, she will provide some introductory remarks uh, for, for the event tonight. Over to you, Councillor Carr. Thank you so much, Andy. And uh, thank you, uh, Amanda, for your wonderful song and your very kind welcome to your traditional territories. I'm so pleased to be here tonight and thank you all for taking the time to join us. I also wanna give a special thanks to our partners at Simon Fraser, our hardworking city staff, and to the fantastic group of panelists. I've been enjoying these events so far. You've got always great panelists. It's a really great learning um, experience. I also wanna note that there are several other council members who have joined us to hear uh, from the panelists and all of you, uh, Councillors Boyle, uh, Councillor Di Genova, Councillor Fry, Councillor Kirby Young, Councillor Swanson, and Councillor Weeb. It's a great topic tonight, uh, the case for complete neighbourhoods. I think most of us realise our neighbourhoods have been changing, sometimes very rapidly within Vancouver. And we have heard as councillors that these have not always been the kind of changes that people want or that they need. The Vancouver plan is guiding long-term planning citywide on these unceded lands that we call Vancouver. And, and that plan does provide an opportunity to consider transformative actions we can undertake as a city. The reason for this event and for our other dialogues is to have discussions with you, with the broader community, as well as key thought leaders to help us imagine a more equitable and a more resilient Vancouver. One of the key actions on our climate emergency response is to build more walkable, complete neighborhoods, aiming to have 90% of people live, in, live within an easy walk or roll of their daily needs. And that goal is set for 2030. When people are close to where they need to get to, whether it's a coffee shop, a doctor's office, a grocery store, they are more likely to walk or roll, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and providing health benefits. Complete neighborhoods though can mean so many different things to different people. I think some of the one, uh, the elements of a complete neighborhood that most people think about though are number one, a variety of housing options. So including homes of varying sizes uh, to serve the needs of you know, individuals, families, households that are large or small, as well as different tenures um, because we have both owners and renters in the city. The most basic requirement, however, is that housing is affordable to the range of incomes within our city. And I would add insufficient supply to match the demographic need. For example, if 50% of people or thereabouts are renters in Vancouver and their median income is about $50,000 and affordability means paying no more than one third of income on rent, half of the renter households that's about 75,000 households need housing in Vancouver that rents for less than $1,375 a month. We know that that's not the case yet. Another important option to consider is missing middle housing, including townhouses, row houses, courtyard apartment buildings that can fill a gap in the types of housing that the city has today. Walkable complete neighborhoods also need neighborhood serving the businesses grocery stores, we just had a motion on that at council, pharmacies, other key businesses near homes. Social, secondly, social, cultural and recreational amenities, including schools and childcare, community centers, neighborhood houses and cultural spaces. And three, public spaces, parks, plazas and other gathering places, which I think so many of us use during COVID <laughs> and increasingly recognized are critical to our mental and physical well-being. I think we all know that many of Vancouver's neighborhoods are not complete. Some have different kinds of housing, but no stores near them. Others have a decent mix of stores, but don't provide enough community services or public spaces or offer safe walking or cycling routes to get to them. Some areas have limited housing options, limited stores and shops and limited services. And um, that we need to change. 
The needs of each neighborhood vary, but ensuring that all residents are equitably provided the housing and services they need, that does not change. Of course, I mean, what we have to do is change it so that they can have equitable access to housing and services. Of course, tonight we can't talk about every possible element of a complete neighborhood. Uh, we just have a short amount of time together. But I think our panelists will provide a thoughtful review of where we're coming from and where we need to go into the future. And I am looking forward to hearing their ideas. So I thank you all for attending. I hope you enjoy the discussion and continue to particip participate in other of the engagement opportunities in the coming months to help shape our Vancouver plan and the future of our city. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Carr. Those are um, great thoughts and reminders of what we're working on this evening. So thank you again to um, the City of Vancouver for your uh, vision and, um, and, and hosting of tonight's event. Um, I guess it's time for me to tell you who I am. Um, and so I am one of the SFU co-hosts of this event. And so I'll just mention um, uh, myself as moderator, along with my partners at SFU, who are also working with our partners at the City of Vancouver to co-host these events. My name is Meg Holden. I am uh, the director of the Urban Studies Program at SFU. Myself, I'm a fifth generation Canadian, I'm born in Ontario and living uh, happily in Vancouver, moving steadily east um, since 2003 through, this, through the city's neighborhoods. Um, our other SFU partners include the City Program and Director of the City Program, Andy Yan, who is co-moderator this evening, as well as SFU Public Square, and you'll find uh, lots of extremely helpful Public Square people in the Zoom um, environment this evening who are available to help with technical issues. I see that a couple of people are noticing some, some technical issues. Most of these can be solved through the magic of Zoom. So please do, um, don't hesitate to raise your, your technical issues um, with, uh, and, and, and uh, tech support, um, Rachel or Cassandra or others will help. Uh, and then the other SFU partner is SFU Woodwards. Um, and, uh, and the uh, Van City Office of Community Engagement. Andy, did you want to say hello at this point and just introduce yourself too? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Andy and I'm the director of the city program and I'd like to welcome to you uh, with, I believe it's our third event with uh, our fine partners with the city of Vancouver in the development of the citywide plan. And um, I'd like to, of course, um, welcome everybody as always, I think with this kind of great series of public events in terms of the conversations about uh, about the community about the future of our communities of, in terms of its past present and future and I think that uh, I think we have a wonderful collection of uh, panelists today in terms of really facilitating this conversation about what makes a complete neighborhood and I think just to kind of um, I, that's kind of quickly my comments and and you're an East fan boy and I'm an East fan boy and I think that part of this is really I think this conversation about neighborhoods is I think one of the really interesting statistics that have uh, kind of occurred recently was actually that while owners and renters have very differing uh, points of satisfaction when it comes to their dwellings, their specific units that they live in, in uh, the metropolitan Vancouver and the city of Vancouver, of course, is part of that, that what you find is that the satisfaction with neighborhoods actually are equally shared between owners and renters about their neighborhoods. That is, that both owners and renters in, in, in irrespective of which neighborhood they are, they find at least a tremendous amount of satisfaction in the neighborhoods they live in. So I think that this is, I think, a very apt time in terms of really talking about really the future of these neighborhoods. So yeah. I, yeah, I, and, and I, I don't want to kind of keep our conversations from our great panelists today. So I'll hand it over to you, Meg. Yeah, so we are going to, I'm going to, Andy and I will introduce our seven 
panelists uh, momentarily, but just before we really get into that, and because that's going to kick our conversation off in a host of really fascinating ways, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, what we're going to do is I just wanted to also just run through some of the ways that we, we are hoping that you will contribute to the conversation. Many of you have already located the chat. Please do feel free to use the chat for technical questions, checking in with um, with one another. There are right now over 300, almost 400 people here. Um, also, please do find the Q&A button on Zoom, which is a place where you can pose questions. You can also vote up. We'll then raise the uh, likelihood that we'll be able to have the panelists address those questions live. We're obviously going to try and cram as much uh, juicy discussion into this evening's event as we can, but we won't be able to get to all of your questions. There is also the opportunity in the Q&A box to have your question answered via text. So if you do ask a question, even if you aren't able to hear your hear the question addressed, still check back in the Q&A box because you may find that one of the panelists has, has offered an answer or some more food for thought. And it's not only um, the other way that I wanted to let people know about in order to contribute to the discussion, can we, um, could someone, could Rachel, can you share with us uh, the instructions for contributing to the Jamboards? We are using Jamboards uh, tonight, and that's another way that you can share your comments or your questions. Uh, ideas that are going to be fed back into this ongoing public planning process. Uh, those are those jam boards are operating in a separate location from Zoom. We're going to keep those open a little bit later than the event tonight. So in case you um, have a thought following the event and you want to add it to the jam board after the fact, you can do that. These Jamboards also are being moderated by city staff and by SFU students. So you can uh, get your questions addressed in some other ways. There are instructions and links to the Jamboards in the chat. So I'm just gonna pause in case you wanna try and configure, I know, you know, with one screen, you're trying to configure it to have um, what you need to see and no more than what you need to see on the screen at one at one point. But if you want to just look in the chat window and open up a Jamboard just to see what it looks like. And so you have it open in case you get a lightning bolt um, that you want to make sure is captured. The other thing we will be doing throughout the event is we'll be asking you a series of poll questions, just a few. And uh, that's one other piece of information uh, that will help us really gauge your um, input and your um, where you're at with respect to defining and understanding and promoting complete neighborhoods within our city um, this evening as, uh, as people who have been able to um, to make it out for this event tonight and as part of the ongoing process. Just to remind you, we are recording the event. So this um, will be available for viewing afterwards um, for those who weren't able to be there or if you wanna return to some of the conversation. Uh, if you would like, you can turn on closed captioning and you can see a, uh, a text version of what's being said as well. You can use the live transcript CC button. We are also offering ASL interpretation. And so you can um, see our uh, ASL signers in, in, your, um, in your view options as well. And again, please let us know. Um, Tech Help, Kim, uh, our, our assistants, um, will be uh, provided to you if you need it. Um, Andy, did you want to just mention the, the community guidelines just to make sure that we use our time together as safely and wisely as we can? You bet. 
And I think that it's important to note the community guidelines that we will be following that the that the community guidelines we, will, will be online, but just a brief note on the most important ones. Um, there will be zero tolerance for those who promote discrimination or harm against others. Uh, please respect the opinions of others. Um, don't assume pronoun, gender, knowledge base on someone's name or video image. And please um, as be as present as possible that it's if you do need to get up or 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 take a break, please uh, please feel free to. And I think that that really I think culminates our uh, our community guidelines. Thank you very much. Okay, so right before we get to the panel, then let's just get one warm up poll question going. If we could, please, Rachel. We think that everybody will be able to um, to weigh in on this question. From my perspective, I can see the live results as people are, ooh, the east side is edging up, west side, ooh. East side represent. <laughs> I'll give you five more seconds. So get your votes in. Okay, and let's take a look. We'll just share the results quickly. And look at this, we've got non-Vancouverites <laughs> edging out the next, the next highest um, plurality. I was sharing with, with Andy um, from the city's last exercise in comprehensive planning, um, the ideas book that the city of Vancouver published. And actually I was noticing how many of the comments found within that ideas book from the mid 1990s were from other municipalities and not from Vancouver. So there is a, a part of this conversation about the, the um, who gets to, who, who has a stake in, in Vancouver's neighborhoods as well. Okay, so without any further ado, thank you very much for that. Our first panelist is uh, from outside of Vancouver <laughs> and it is Harvey Lowe. So we're very grateful to have Harvey joining us from Toronto, noting uh, how late in the day it is in Toronto for, for Harvey to be joining us. Um, Harvey is the former manager. He's recently retired of community services and the social research unit at the city of Toronto where he had a long and um, hardworking and storied career in neighborhood planning. Uh, he has worked on many place-based initiatives within the city of Toronto, notably the strong neighborhood strategy, as well as uh, having a hand in the recently com completed Regent Park revitalization plan that many of us have, have heard about. Harvey, great to have you with us. Thank you, Meg. So first of all, thank you so much to the City of Vancouver and SFU for welcoming and having me on this session. Um, and being a, a Torontonian, I'm just a bit about uh, my personal side. I'm a third generation born and bred Torontonian. However, my wife is fourth generation. Her grandmother was born in Vancouver and raised there. So part of my heart is with Vancouver. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share my screen and just go over a couple of the things that we did in Toronto. Now, I'm going to be talking a little bit about not just what we've done uh, right uh, in, in the city, but I also want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we've, we could have done better. So one of the things I want to focus on is people. Uh, these are the reasons why we plan. You can talk about an official plan, you can talk about an economic development plan, but it is people that we plan for. And, and that's the key ingredient in neighborhood planning that I want to emphasize. Uh, first of all, I do think that we are losing sight of the purpose of planning for complete neighborhoods. I believe that we have to review who we plan for and how we do it. For example, the, the traditional ways of understanding who we plan for have changed. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But we also must understand how we plan for these people. We must not forget that we must include all steps of the traditional planning process that need to be fulfilled from problem definition to most importantly, outcomes. That's why we do these things. 
So I'm going to spend a little bit of time, uh, now I know Councillor Carr talked about her definition of complete neighborhoods, but here are some of the things that we came up with Toronto as a checklist, and I'm not going to uh, go over the top few because they're pretty obvious, but the ones at the bottom you'll see might be surprising. First of all, safe communities are important, whether they be crime, traffic, uh, in-home safety, uh, we want to have clean uh, neighborhoods. We, uh, Councillor Carr talked about housing options and affordability economic opportunities, and we want to have a healthy local uh, economy. We want to have efficient services, services that are accessible, that are eligible to people. We want to have services for roads and public transit that meet people's needs. We also want to have amenities, open space, recreation, social hubs, and amenities also include design elements. And we talked about walkability, we heard that already. Identity, heritage, and culture. We also need to be connected. The internet is huge and it needs to be uh, put forth as one of the, the challenges in, in, in complete neighborhoods. And in Toronto, we're actually having a number of initiatives to ensure that low income uh, families have access to the internet. So these are the parts that we are talking about equity. We wanna have uh, neighborhoods that are welcoming in terms of gender, sexual orientation, age, ethnic origin, language and culture, education, Income and poverty, that includes homelessness, family circumstance, single parents, a person's health status, physical challenges, cognitive challenges, religious faith, and here's a new one, political faith. All these things are important for a complete neighborhood. A picture is worth a thousand words, and we all talk about equity, and I think this picture describes it best. I'm not going to describe it, just take a look at this. We are now at the process of rearranging those boxes so we can move from not only equality, but equity. So I wanna talk about some trends that are really important to take, take uh, into account in terms of the recent demographic shifts in terms of the, the neighborhood planning that we have to do. We're seeing a lot of urban sprawl now. Populations are moving from the downtown to suburban areas. Is this temporary? We don't know. Of, along with this comes an exodus and higher demand for housing, particularly in the suburbs. We're seeing declining rents and increasing vacancies in the downtown areas, less demand, greater supply. That might be temporary. Uh, we're also seeing a changing nature of work. Commuting has gone down during the pandemic. Telecommuting has gone up. Will this change the face of the labor market in the long-term future? I don't know. Poverty in people. Pandemic has worsened the income gap for many people. Research has, has said that to us in Toronto. In Toronto, we've seen full and part-time work with part-time fast outpacing full-time. There's been a loss of low wage jobs in Toronto and a surge in high paid jobs. I'm sure it's the same in, Toronto, uh, in Vancouver. Homelessness continues to be a crisis. Poverty in place, homelessness, underemployment and underemployment is growing. The pandemic has also worsened the income gap. For example, we did a long-term study between 1970 and, and 2005, the percent of low-income neighborhoods in Toronto grew from 19% to 53%. And, and you can look at, at middle-income neighborhoods that have decreased from 66% to 29%, and high-income neighborhoods grew from 15% to 19%. The changing rainbow of who we serve is also important. Visible minorities are, no, are now becoming visible majorities, and the lines of ethnicity are blurred. Many people are coming from mixed backgrounds. Changing linguistics means that we're not just delivering services for one single language, but there's a multitude of dialects that we need to, to account for now. This is a simple map, just to look at the green areas. Don't focus on anything else. The green areas are areas in Toronto where there is no predominant ethnic group. It's a pie with many slivers, and that's probably the fact with, with Vancouver. We have to have neighborhoods that plan for everyone. Just a couple of things that we've done recently with the Strong Neighborhood Strategy. We've had a strong neighborhood strategy that's been in operation for five years now, and its sole purpose is to prove the outcome and advance equity of all groups, of all people, and build those opportunities in neighborhoods with poor outcomes. This includes the importance of geography, where we did some studies that looked at those suburban areas that, that had a lot of need but didn't have a lot of service. We did a, a consultation that was very comprehensive, research consultations to develop methodologies, public consultations and partner consultations. We also had actionable items, everything from setup of neighborhood action teams to action partnerships, which dealt with partners in the community that worked hand in hand with the city of Toronto. Let's take a look at some of the things that worked. 
Some mixed income neighborhoods we've developed, such as Regent Park, were inclusive communities as opposed to isolated enclaves. We wanted comprehensive and implementation and an implementation approach, which included multiple city divisions tackling common issues. Not to go through this whole slide, but the important one is actually the one at the bottom, where we're moving now towards an outcome-based budgeting. What could have done better? We, we're really lacking me the measurement of true outcomes, and we could do that a lot better. We study the problem, but we need to look at the outcomes. We could do a better consultation and engagement, particularly with some of the issues of temporary housing for homeless. And we need stronger policy research and technology teamwork, different skill sets to manage the problem, to do proper comprehensive planning. So in the end, I'm just going to wrap up. The traditional land use approaches need to be mindful of people. We need to adopt an outcome measurements approach rather than an output approach, simply counting things. And that's why it's always a matter of putting people first ahead of objects and structures. And that's the reason why we do things. And I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Hardy. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is Shirley Chan. And as Shirley, I guess, comes forward in the digital dais, uh, Shirley Chan is a member of the Order of British Columbia and has been an activist for Vancouver for over 60 years. In the 1960s and 70s, Shirley spearheaded the organizing of the Strathcona Property Owners and Tenants Association, the Sp SPOTA, to uh, stop the demolition of Strathcona and Vancouver's Chinatown, and to stop the building of freeways in Vancouver. Uh, Shirley has worked for a variety of community nonprofits, as well as municipal and federal public services. And I'd like to pass it on to Shirley. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, and I just want to also add my thanks to Simon Fraser University, which uh, was my first university where I did my bachelor's, and the city of Vancouver, where I also had the opportunity to work uh, for some years um, as a younger person. Um, and I want to say hello to all the uh, panelists and uh, the participants tonight. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to be here with us. Um, as Andy said, my name is Shirley Chan, and I have been an activist in Vancouver for more than 60 years. And I say that because I started when I was about 10, helping my mother go door to door to organize a community around uh, to stop urban renewal, collect to get them to sign a petition. So I learned early about how to organize. My mother was a natural born organizer. And she deserves a lot of credit for what has happened to our uh, city. So next slide. In the um, uh, 1950s and 60s, uh, this is my family home behind and, and members of my family, um, there was no citizen engagement in planning. Um, indeed, racist policies drove many of the decisions uh, that were made about the plan in our city. For example, disperse the Chinese was a, an important part of our um, redevelopment of our city. And uh, as citizens living in, in, in town, uh, close to Chinatown, we learned about urban renewal by word of mouth, as the city's notice was in English only, of course, and uh, only went to property owners and not to tenants and um, renters. We uh, did our best as neighbors. We shared information, we talked, we organized as best we could, given some of the handicaps we had. Next slide. Thank you. Um, by 1968, this was sort of what Strathcona looked like. There were lots of holes where homes used to be and empty lots. And um, phases one and two of uh, urban renewal had been uh, implemented. And we did get public housing as an option. However, the problem with public housing is it fails to recognize extended families. And that broke up families. Um, and we uh, had found that by 1968, during phases one and two, they displaced 3,400 residents and cleared 58 acres of land. So phase three was about to start and that was um, seen as our last chance uh, to save what was left of our neighborhood and Chinatown from demolition and the freeway. I'm doing this because I think history informs what we should do next, right? So. Um, next slide. The city 
here's a typical street and the city paid between six and eight thousand dollars for the homes and lots like these that uh, meant of course that you could not buy a replacement home anywhere else in the city and um, we didn't find public housing met our needs very well so we formed the Strathcona Property Owners and Tenants Association which is an inclusive title alone because it wasn't just about homeowners and property owners but also about tenants SPOTA was formed to fight urban renewal and the freeway, which would have run through our neighborhood as well. And we joined with other communities right across the city from Chinatown to Grandview Woodland to the West Enders uh, to Carisdale and Dunbar and the West, uh, to, to, to fight the freeway. Next slide. But we weren't just protesters. We didn't just always um, say you couldn't do things. We were very happy to engage in any planning processes on our own if the city wasn't prepared to support that. Luckily for us, this social planning department became an ally. They were actually instructed to help us relocate um, and they chose instead to listen to what we had to say. And then we began to get really engaged in community planning. And here's a charrette that was uh, being uh, led by an architect from uh, Birmingham and Wood who had located into Chinatown in order to help stop the demolition of Chinatown and to stop the freeway. So other allies of ours, which we were fortunate to have um, around the table um, where we were negotiating with three levels of government as a community on an agreement to change redevelopment of our neighborhood to rehabilitation, which is what, where we wanted to go, um, was Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And one thing a little thing about CMHC is they were responding to the federal minister who was very adamant that the communities be engaged. And they were at the table as the federal government and uh, we were together four levels of government. And we built um, a co-op on scattered lots uh, and a linear park that was part of the infilling of the vacant lots that, had, uh, ex that existed because of the demolition of many of the homes in the neighborhood. Next slide. So finally in 1973, after six years of fighting the freeway, the freeway was finally scrapped. And uh, the Minister of Urban Affairs refused to fund a project that did not have the support of the people most directly affected. Those were his words. And so uh, it was also a time uh, when team was elected as, as the majority on council and they replaced the nonpartisan association. And the NDP replaced the social credit in Victoria all in 1973. And so we got the C bus as a third crossing. We got a new director of planning who came in once a uh, team had been elected. And then um, they set up the Vancouver City Planning Commission with a new lead that would uh, start a planning program that was based on genuine city citizen consultation and engagement. The citizens were heard, the policies were values driven, the West End was down zoned, Falls Creek South was built as a model community with diversity, schools, parks, a range of housing options, recreational facilities, schools, walkability, accessible, uh, retail and commercial uses were all part of what formed this model community. And uh, the seawall, of course, that people could walk upon. Um, the rule of thumb in designing this model community was that everybody would be able to live here. So we had one third, one third, one third type of housing for affordability and co-ops and social housing. That was um, uh, seen as an ideal community and it remains a wonderful place to live and, um, and work because you can actually work there too. Um, and play because many of us go down there to play even though, though we don't live there. So then Vancouver, next slide, went from being known as a setting in search of a city to a livable city because it was safe, clean, inclusive with great outdoor recreation. And we, were, we got famous thanks to hosting UN Habitat Conference in 67 and the Expo 86 Transportation Fair. Next. So the pressure was on. International recognition brought international pressures. Affordability became an issue. Um, we had higher densities and lots of expensive condos. You can see the, the Science World, which was part of um, a legacy of Expo. 
and we saw a growing income gap that was talked about, young family service workers being left behind. And we couldn't build social housing and co-ops quickly enough and homelessness grew and so did tent cities. So what we have is looking to the future, we have to ask ourselves when planning, Vancouver for whom? We have to build a city based on our values to make some important choices. And do we want clean air and water? Do we want a city that's inclusive? So we can make places for everyone. It's up to us. Thank you. Thank you. Time. Thank you very much, Shirley. That's a, a whirlwind, uh, but fantastic um, reminder of uh, what we can, uh, the neighborhood planning process that is part of our history. Thank you. Um, next up, Yute Lee. Yute is a video columnist for CBC. His About Here YouTube channel uh, has a series of hilarious and informative videos on neighborhood planning topics from missing middle housing to the importance of street food to the incompatibility of nightclubs and much more. Yute. Thanks, Megan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Now I feel like a lot of pressure to just be hilarious. <laughs> I don't know if my presentation is really going to be all that funny, but uh, let me preface this by starting that uh, I don't, I'm not here to really make a case for complete neighborhoods or offer real like too many solutions as a journalist it is, uh, or a columnist is, you know, usually I complain more about things. <laughs> so, uh, you know, to me, what I wanted to talk about today was sort of the why, uncovering why uh, Vancouver has experienced so many difficulties in introducing a diversity of housing and uh, businesses and services into its residential neighborhoods. It's a, a topic that I had the pleasure of covering uh, with Urbanarium last summer for a video called The Missing Middle Mystery. This is gonna be a shortened version of that. So we start here with this building called the Wilder Snail. Oh, I should probably also put this to presentation mode so I don't give away the slides too quickly. <laughs> uh, the Wilder Snail in Strathcona. And, and this building's awesome. It's got a, a cafe, a grocery, and a hair salon on the first floor with 11 units of housing, 11. <laughs> Somehow they fit that all over there uh, on the upper floors. Uh, and, you know, it's a building that's really well loved by the neighborhood. I used to frequent this place quite a bit when I worked in the, the area. Uh, but of course, a building like the Wilder Snail is not the norm in Vancouver. You don't see many of these buildings in this city. What is the norm is a building like this or like this, a single family house, one building typically for one family. Uh, these buildings make up 81% of Vancouver's residential land. So that is the norm in Vancouver. So that begs the question for me, why don't we have more Wilder Snails? And the answer to that is quite simple. It's illegal. Uh, let's get into some of the paperwork here. So uh, the Wilder Snail, it, it's an old building. It was built in 1906. And since then, uh, we as a city have introdu introduced uh, a variety of regulations that would effectively make it impossible to build a building like this today. We have setback restrictions. You can't build all the way up to the sidewalk. So you'd have to lop off you know, this side of the building. Uh, take a bit off the top as well to make it comply with height restrictions, which limit buildings to 2.5 stories in residential neighborhoods. Uh, then you got to add parking spaces for all 11 units of uh, uh, housing in this building, which I've tried to visualize here with this uh, rendering. Uh, and then, of course, the kicker is the zoning bylaw. Uh, and in Vancouver, we have zoning bylaws that regulate what you can and can't build, what uses you can and can't have in each you know, parcel of land in the city. Uh, and this is a complicated map, but essentially uh, here's a simpler way to look at it. Everything in yellow is for only residential uses, uh, no apartment buildings, no nothing commercial, um, and you know, primarily single family houses, maybe a laneway house and a secondary suite. In blue is everything else. So what you can see why we don't have wilder snails all around Vancouver is for most of Vancouver, you just can't, it's just not allowed. So to me, of course, the obvious next question is why do we have these rules? And, you know, for me, when I did my research, that really took me back to the year 1927 when these zoning bylaws were first uh, created. 
They were created by this guy, Harlan Bartholomew, with the express purpose of preventing the intrusion of apartment houses in single or two family residential areas. So what was going on with these apartment houses? Well, back in the 1900s, the early 1900s, uh, downtown areas were not really perceived to be all that great, uh, often associated with industry and other uh, uses that you just really didn't want to live beside. Um, and of course, unfortunately, a lot of apartments at that time uh, were perceived to have fallen into disrepair. They were associated with really cramped living spaces, poor air circulation. People were really obsessed with air circulation for some reason at the time. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, to add to the terror, there were often outbreaks of diseases like cholera and tuberculosis. Um, of course, there were also fires that often happened at these apartment buildings. And because they were so close together, uh, these fires would quickly spread and often engulf entire cities. So for those who could afford it, <laughs> an escape from all that terror uh, was the single family house uh, far away from the city uh, with nice separated lots, uh, you know, <laughs> which would prevent fires from spreading from building one building to the next. Uh, that move was very much encouraged or facilitated by the invention of new transportation technologies like the car. I don't know why I called it transportation technology, like, you know, the car, you know, and streetcars. Uh, but of course, it wasn't that simple. Uh, mixed into that move was a lot of other complex and maybe not as uh, innocent intentions. Uh, downtown areas and apartments were also notoriously homes for immigrants and the, the working poor. And you know, uh, what you can kind of tell, uh, this is a cartoon I uh, uh, found online from Vancouver Saturday Sunset in 1917. Uh, it, it compares the typical home of a Vancouver white working man uh, to a warren on Carroll Street infested by 2000 Chinese. Uh, yikes. So uh, as you can tell, there, were a, there was a messy mix of intentions behind, you know, why this sort of move was happening. Uh, but ultimately, all that messy mix culminated in something like this zoning bylaw. Uh, the, the fear at the time was that downtown areas with its immigrants, with its cramped apartments, with its industry, would continue to grow and spread past the downtown area and into urban, uh, sorry, suburban sort of residential neighborhoods. And people were having none of it. They uh, introduced a bylaw like this to really contain that growth and to keep all of downtown in one place uh, and leave the single family residential areas alone. Now, fast forward to the present and things have changed a little bit. We have running water, uh, fire extinguishers, smoke detectors and uh, building codes. Uh, basically all that is to say uh, we aren't as concerned about you know, the typical things we were scared about with apartments such as cholera or uh, fires. Oh, hi, Andy. I will try to rush through the rest of this presentation. <laughs> now, of course, while those practical concerns might not, uh, might not be here anymore, uh, of course, we still have the zoning bylaw. And with that, uh, we still have, uh, you know, uh, hmm, well, let's say, and we've also sort of developed a culture uh, and appreciation for essentially single family residential neighborhoods. Anytime anyone proposes uh, adding a little bit of density, a little bit of variety to these single family neighborhoods, there is an uproar. Uh, I've selected a couple, you know, quotes here. I won't read them all out, but, you know, they call it densification on steroids. Uh, this one in Kitsilano just gets right to the point. Uh, it's a ghetto. <laughs> and, you know, what you kind of realize is that, you know, uh, the, the, the zoning bylaws that really limit the, uh, the diversity, the variety of uses that, ex uh, you know, that could exist in our residential neighborhoods were once motivated by, uh, you know, some practical concerns around public health and, you know, maybe some not so innocent ones as well. Uh, those are no longer really with us. And what that's been replaced by is really, um, uh, you know, a, a culture for, uh, wanting single family neighborhood homes. And when you uh, survey even millennials, uh, the, the, the majority <laughs> prefer, you know, having, I mean, I get it, right? Like having this, you know, the front lawn and the backyard and a relatively quiet neighborhood with nothing really, you know, not, nothing too disturbing around. Uh, so, you know, to me, uh, this idea of complete neighborhoods is a little bit more controversial than it seems at face value. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing how we discuss it from here on out. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, thank you, Tay. Um, in case um, the audience is wondering what happens when I show up or uh, Meg shows up, uh, this is the face of time. And as the face of time, uh, we, we, it's our one minute warning to our various uh, um, uh, presenters this evening that they have one minute left. So in case you're curious. Um, so our next instructor, is, uh, our next pre uh, presenter is Amy Robinson, who is the founder and chief executive uh, sorry, the executive director of Local BC, uh, who have spearheaded, I think, a number of important research uh, projects to look at the importance of local businesses upon uh, communities around uh, British Columbia. And we'll, and we, as we have our our biography, detailed biographies come up in the chat, that I would like to um, pass it over to Amy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Just going to share my screen here. So I guess if I'm here to make a case, it's for the fact that, um, you know, we all think we need to have businesses in our complete communities. And, uh, and I want to make the case for the fact that we need to have uh, local businesses in, in our communities, not just uh, not just multinationals. Here's a picture of one of, uh, of, of a diverse neighborhood out in uh, West Point Gray with uh, different um, goods and services on offer. And, um, you know, I think many, Councillor Carr mentioned it as well, that, you know, the idea of a complete community is that people can access goods and services and um, other things that they need within a short walk, bike, or roll. And, um, and so um, local businesses offer us uh, many social environmental benefits and also economic benefits that help create complete communities. Um, this graphic is from our 2019 research on the impact of retailers and restaurants in BC. And it shows that um, local businesses compared to multinational corporations have um, a bigger economic impact. So they not only contribute to their communities in various ways, but they have um, 4.6 times the economic impact. So the revenue that flows to them, 63% stays in the community compared to 14% um, with multinational competitors. This means that they create 8.4 times the employment per square foot. So they're much more productive with every, uh, every square foot. So if, um, if there's a limited space to locate the businesses in our complete communities, then uh, I think that uh, helps to make the argument that there should be many local businesses. Um, they also create more uh, revenue per square foot, 8.1 times um, per dollar, um, 8.1 times the revenue per square foot of multinationals. And, um, you know, they really, you know, we're, we're trying to encourage a shift that, that consumers spend their money with local businesses. And we can't do that unless we locate local businesses in their communities. Um, you know, convenience is, is a thing, right? I mean, people really want to, whether or not Strathcona residents want to shop at No Frills, if No Frills is what's on Hastings Street, you know, if you need milk, you're going to gonna buy it at No Frills. And so, you know, I want to make the case that uh, we have to do better in terms of um, locating more independent businesses, looking for ways, policy means, zoning uh, development that will locate more independent businesses in our neighborhoods. Um, we're encouraging a 10% shift. If we could shift 10% of spending towards independent businesses, it would create more than 14,000 jobs in BC and send $4.3 billion in, uh, into the coffers of, uh, of BC businesses. So, you know, this, this virtuous effect happens because uh, BC businesses, they're owned locally, the profits stay local, they spend much more of their revenues with other local businesses, and you get this virtuous cycle where those businesses then spend 31% of their revenues with other local businesses, and it really creates an interconnected ecosystem that uh, creates a stronger uh, economy. And they also donate much more to local, local charities like uh, local schools and soccer teams. So why, why do we even care? 
Um, the, the model for densification in our city is mostly happening, we're planning it along commercial corridors and we're displacing many independent businesses. And um, unfortunately, when, uh, so during the demolition and construction phase, they're displaced. And then when the new spaces go back in, they, they uh, much more rarely occupy those spaces. So this is uh, the independent on Main Street. There was a study done in 2017 by Wes Regan, who was at the time, uh, it was his master's thesis for SFU, and he looked at 30 blocks of Main Street where much of this style of development is happening and found that uh, chains are blooming, 74% increase in the number of chains along this, those 30 blocks versus, um, you know, independents aren't even holding their own. They had a 6.4% decrease. Uh, new, new mixed use development on the street, uh, it was more than double the chance that you would have a chain in those, um, those new commercial spaces. So what can we do about it? Um, here's, a, here's a city block in Vancouver. I challenge you to, uh, you know, to tell me where this is because um, the no frills, Starbucks, uh, you know, Shoppers Drug Mart, TD Bank, uh, it's kind of everywhere could be dozens of places in the city. And, uh, you know, we have to do this better. We have to do densification better. If we're going to densify along commercial corridors uh, in the majority of our developments, then we have to take bold action to make sure that independent businesses, whether it's the format or the affordability or whatever the issues are, that they have a chance to relocate on those, um, in those new commercial spaces. Also reducing red tape. Uh, we had a lot of uh, empty storefronts before the pandemic. We're gonna have a lot more now and it takes a really long time and costs a lot of money to get a permit or a license for a business in the city of Vancouver. Our recent research showed that it would, took a business an average of eight months, just over eight months to get a permit or license in the city and cost them about half a million dollars and the broader local economy an additional couple hundred thousand in lost employment and supplier sales. So recently uh, we saw, you know, online accepting online uh, permitting applications. We saw almost 300 uh, temper, temper, temporary patio permits in a couple of months. So we could see, we saw that change was possible at the city. And so I would love to see more of it in the permitting and licensing department. And then lastly, you know, a review of the zoning bylaws that um, that Ute was talking about. Um, you know, this is a, an example of a much loved local business that really had to put so much time and energy into, be, into being able to sell quiche and coffee from their, you know, neighborhood retail store. And, you know, you can see on this petition, 15,000 people, numerous uh, letters to city councillors, articles in the paper before they were allowed to, uh, to do what they were doing in, um, in their neighborhood, which, you know, these are some of the much loved businesses in, uh, in the city, these unique quirky places that make our neighborhoods interesting. Um, you know, not every business is going to have this kind of uh, resources to, um, you know, to save their business. So I, I think that we need like a wholesale review of all the wonky um, regulations that don't allow retail businesses to have a small amount of production or to run a workshop or, or whatever in their spaces. Uh, we're going to need it more than ever after the pandemic is over. That's it for me. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amy. And I noticed um, a lot of uh, receptiveness to the showing in particular. So maybe if you could take a moment and sort of clarify whether all of those stats refer to the city of Vancouver specifically, there were some questions about some of them, if you can in the- Sorry, in the, the stats around which? Well, maybe if you could just take a peek at some of the Q and A's about, okay. about your- Is it in the Q and A or in the chat? I noticed them in the chat actually, but maybe I could ask um, if the people okay. who wanted those specific those specifics to um, frame their questions in the Q and A. Thank you. Um, next up, Javier Campos. Javier is president of Heritage Vancouver Society and works as an architect. Um, don't take uh, his status um, at face value because from what I've learned, he is working hard to redefine what heritage means in the city of Vancouver. Javier. Uh, 
Meg, I'm going to change. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to be speaking through the lens of heritage here. Um, as I only have a few minutes, I would like to discuss what I believe heritage needs to do in order to contribute to the conception of complete neighborhoods. Uh, first, I would like to say, if we are speaking about heritage and history, it is important to note that we are on unceded land, that Vancouver has existed for less than 200 years, and this land has a long tradition of occupation and habitation before the settlers arrived. The fact that I will be discussing heritage policies framed by Vancouver should not be taken as a sign that we're not in need of addressing the detrimental legacy of the colonial project. I would like to dwell on some reasons uh, why to dismantle the Anglo-colonial centered heritage and its recent offshoot character um, for it creates and perpetuates an incomplete idea of our city and the stories that we use to define ourselves. I believe this may seem like a tenuous way to go to discuss and focus discussion on complete neighborhoods, but I would put to you that this discussion is not esoteric, but essential. For me, it is hard to understand how we could come to an understanding of what complete means without under undertaking a frank, and I would posit ongoing reflection of who we, an inclusive we, a diverse we, a collective we are. To me, that means, as Gauguin so poignantly put it, to ask, where do we come from? What are we and where are we going? I would like to begin here by speaking about what heritage policies in Vancouver have fought for, uh, not speaking about what Vancouver policies have fought for or what they have given us. Rather, I would like to talk how heritage discourses in Vancouver have somehow come to systematically exclude and silence the voices of those who do not to conform to the narrative that supports the official origin story. Before I start, it is important to note that this is not a singular attack on the policies developed on the desks and in the meeting rooms of the city of Vancouver, nor is it a dismissal of the peoples that have propagated these policies. If I was to describe it, I would characterize it more like a diffuse and wide ranging indictment of the ideas that helped conceive these policies. Uh, and is, and is, um, I do not think that we can lay blame at those who did things that they at the time believed to be best practice. I believe there are many influential and ordinary citizens that believed and honestly promoted the foundation on which these policies were written. However, and it is a big however, I do hold responsible those who keep perpetuating ideas in the face of evidence of harm and exclusion, either for the sake of an outdated ideal or for their own benefit. It is a pervasive playbook that we need to always look out for. Their continued denial and dismissal of criticism of Anglo-Colonial heritage causes harm and are an impediment to making our city and society complete. Now I would like to talk about one of the many examples from Vancouver's history, monster homes. It is a term that appears repeatedly in housing discourse and has been leveled from everything from the Vancouver special in 1960s as a prox proxy for aesthetic inadequacy to any immodest and ostentatious house. Here I would like to reflect on its use in the 1980s housing debates centered around groups of Chinese Canadians and Chinese immigrants. I'm not here to debate the merit or inferiority of these houses for I sincerely believe that that would miss the point. I believe that we need to be frank with ourselves in that is instance and in many other instances the term was used as a proxy for subtle nativist racism concealed in heritage policies and aesthetic language. Exclusion of this history makes for an incomplete picture. Vancouver experiences migration. That migration brings in new ideas of built form and this changes our urban fabric. This is how cities develop. These houses are not blights on our city. They are merely an expression of a moment or our history. They emerge from the complex interaction of land, land use policies, bylaws, investing opportunities, immigration policies, and so much more. In essence, the messy business of living, one that deserves recognition and acceptance, not derision and rejection. In the end, this is our story. This is our heritage. To assert that these houses are heritage is often seen as heretical, given Vancouver's obsession with pre-1940s colonial past and an aesthetic bias in its heritage policies. 
in Vancouver, a period of about 54 years has come to cast a long shadow over the 80 years that have followed. We now devote ourselves to discussing colonial language and institutions, how they construct, implement, and maintain systemic racism. It should be no different for the built environment and the policies that craft it. The policies that mandate mimicry of Anglo-colonial history have led to buildings that would have been anathema to the people whose period they claim to replicate, and it needs to stop. We need to make our way out of the trap of self-importance created by Vancouver's colonial heritage. As much as this is a case for equitable representation, the repeal of policies that promote a mythical past through rarefied replication, or what has come to, come to be known as disnification, our urban environment, disnification of our urban environment, it is also a case for diversity. We know that housing does not just happen in houses, it happens in a multitude of urban forms. We need urban forms to reflect people's socioeconomic standing, cultural traditions, and access to capital or land. A complete neighborhood must, out of necessity, allow for the mixing of housing types. Our legacy of creating and maintaining many of our neighborhoods as monocultures through heritage and other policies could not, by definition, have a hope of creating a complete neighborhood that is diverse and equitable. We have work in front of us to correct the role some heritage narratives play in the effacement and erasure of history. We can no longer condone the obliteration of inconvenience that do not coincide with manufactured history or an idealized environment. That is to say, something palatable to the hegemony. I believe it is a moral imperative to work towards complete neighborhoods, one that allow for many histories to be told. A neighborhood that is diverse and comprised of multiple housing types and tenures. The built environment should reflect us, all of us. Our history should reflect all of us if it is where we conceive of ourselves. Heritage needs to shed the promotion of a pernicious fiction based on some vague glorious past and engage in frank, inclusive discussion. We are in a period of transition. Narratives that hang around long enough have a tendency to seem self-evident, but deep down we know that in the past there have been other narratives to organize us and there will be others in the future. Before us, we have an opportunity to shape the future. We must reckon with the colonial past that has shaped our civic policies. We must redress the exclusion those policies have fosters. We must rethink our development policies and by extension, our heritage policies. We must find equitable narratives and accept the historical record and new developments. My goals are clear. Fight for an equitable and inclusive conception of heritage that fosters cultural diversity. Fight for meaningful preservation of all our cities. Fight for a version of heritage that helps create a diverse built environment. If like me and many others, you believe the value of heritage is in recording cultural practice in the built in mind environment of the past. If like me and many others, you believe that heritage has much to offer our current discourse by providing a view that extends across time. And if like me and many others, you believe that heritage can help represent all of the members of our society, then like me, you believe that heritage can have a place at the table in constructing a complete neighborhood and the future we may want and the future we may need. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. And wow, thank you, thank you so much. And again, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to post them in the chat as we'll also uh, go into a larger conversation with our panelists uh, in the, after these presentations are completed. Um, so the next person on our dais is uh, Zarha Esmel, who is the executive director of the vibrant South Vancouver Neighborhood House since 2016, and is also the first director of the Marpole Neighborhood House, which opened under her leadership in 2019. And I think I'll uh, pass, pass, pass you over to Zarha. Zarha. Hey. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Andy. I'm really happy to be here today, and um, I hope people still have some energy. Uh, <laughs> I know it's 7.45, so I'm going to try to be a brief and succinct as best as I can. Um, are my slides visible there? Perfect. So um, as Andy mentioned, my name is Zara Ismail. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm the Executive Director of South Bend Neighborhood House and Marple Neighborhood House. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm so grateful for being invited to participate. 
A big thanks to Meg Holden, Andy Yan, the City of Vancouver, and SFU. Next slide, please. I'm joining you today from the unceded, occupied ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people. I'm grateful to live on the land of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And to the best of my knowledge, what is known as South Vancouver is situated on the land of the same nation that I just mentioned. I'm deeply grateful for the privilege of living, working, and raising my family on these stolen lands as an unindicted uh, guest. Next slide, please. While I am the executive director of two neighborhood houses, um, I'm going to save most of my comments around um, or position them around South Vancouver. This is primarily because of the way that data available to me has been sorted and grouped. And um, by South Vancouver, I'm talking about the large region of Vancouver that runs from Main Street to Boundary and from 41st Avenue down to the Fraser River. It's comprised of three large distinct city neighborhoods. Um, I know that there was some question about what whether they're neighborhoods or districts, which is very interesting. Um, but we refer to them as neighborhoods as Killarney, Victoria, Fraser View, and Sunset. Next slide, please. So South Vancouver is a little known area, even to some of the people who do live there. Most people don't know where South Vancouver starts or ends. But it does have a population of 102,000 people. And it's the area, I mean, 102,000 is almost 15%, around 15% of the city of Vancouver. So about a sixth of us call South Vancouver home. The people who live here are primarily racialized, as you can see from some of the stats that are up there. It's an area in Vancouver that has, has the highest percentage of newcomers to Canada, as well as the majority of residents who speak a non-English language at home. I think it's safe to say it's the most diverse place in the city. The experiences of residents in each of these neighborhoods is quite different, and I'll share some, some statistics um, in the next slide. However, in spite of the size and diversity of these neighborhoods, they are often considered one neighborhood. This was the case for the first several years that I spent as executive director at South Bend Neighborhood House. I was regularly asked to pull together focus groups of South Vancouver residents and comment on issues impacting South Vancouver overall. I immediately felt very uncomfortable about this, realizing that the experience of people living in Champlain Heights, for example, was entirely different from that of people living in Punjabi Market which is over a 15 minute car ride away. Recognizing how many voices were being left out when we spoke of South Vancouver as one, our team started to try to better understand what was going on across the large area and what the neighborhoods within the area are. Who lives there? What do people identify as their natural neighborhoods within this huge region of South Vancouver? Next slide, please. As you can see from some of these statistics, the quality of life is different in each of the South Van neighborhoods. Sunset lacks access to community spaces in a greater way than the other two, while Victoria Fraser View has more families that are financially struggling. In nearly every case, no matter which statistic you look at, these three neighborhoods um, are not faring as well as the city of Vancouver overall. Looking at, I'm gonna take a, just a, a comparison between a South neighborhood and a North neighborhood. I'm going to compare Victoria Fraser View and Grandview Woodlands. Now, this is not at all to take away from Grandview Woodlands, but it's to, to, to ask the question of why different neighborhoods in different areas are treated differently. So let me, I'm going to proceed. So um, Victoria Fraser View has more people. It's bigger geographically. It has significantly more seniors. It has more single parent families. It has a larger average household size and nearly 1,500 more families than Grandview Woodlands. And yet there is a very robust Grandview Woodlands community plan while Victoria Fraser View has a combined community vision plan with Killarney. It's not nearly as sophisticated as the Grandview Woodlands plan, and it's easy to see that the investment that went into the Victoria Fraser View Killarney plan was minimal as compared to its counterpart. Um, the reason that I decided to share the, this particular example was to talk about the systemic inequity and to raise a question about why these neighborhoods are treated so differently. One key difference, and I mean, this is you know, some of our own thinking. But one key difference for sure about these neighborhoods is that only 16.5% of residents in Grandview Woodlands have a non-English mother tongue, while in Victoria Fraser View, 58.9% of residents have a non-English mother tongue. So the question is, how is the city engaging non-English speakers and largely racialized community members? And the answer sadly may be that they're not. When surveys, town halls, public meetings are all held in English only, it's a clear signal to everyone else that they're not invited to the conversation and that their opinions don't matter. 
This event in and of itself, um, you know, interpretation has not been offered, which excludes many of the households across South Vancouver, as well as non-English speakers in other parts of Vancouver. This needs to be recognized and it needs to be changed. Next slide, please. We know that Sunset, Victoria, Fraserview and Killarney residents are not experiencing the same complete neighborhoods as residents in other parts of Vancouver. In my view, there are four elements to a complete neighborhood, people, places, services, and transportation. While people are the strength of South Vancouver in their diversity, resilience, and spirit, the other three areas need a lot of work. There are a few places for people to gather in the neighborhood, which drives people out of the neighborhoods to access basic needs and social connection. However, transportation is also lacking, which further exas exacerbates isolation and disconnectedness. It keep, keep, keeps people stuck in place with few resources available to them. Moreover, there are very few organizations that are con offering concentrated services in South Vancouver and, who, and those who are like SCNH are stretched very thin across a huge region. COVID has made these gaps abundantly clear. People are falling through the cracks. If you were to look at the emergency food access map on the city of Vancouver's website, it clearly demonstrates that all of the food resources are located in certain areas of the city and people experiencing food insecurity in South Vancouver are out of luck. Housing is also hard to come by. There are often large homes in the neighborhoods um, that are rented as separate units to various families. And one large family could be putting together several incomes to be able to afford their rent or their mortgage. There are a lot of newcomers living in basement suites or laneway homes, and there's no doubt in my mind that they would rather live in an apartment that has windows and amenities, but they're not affordable and they're hard to come by. And with new development coming into the neighborhood, large cultural groups are being displaced and ethnocultural communities are eroding. As Shirley had mentioned, the new apartments that are being erected are not suitable for larger diverse families as they weren't back in you know, the 70s in Chinatown. New housing created needs to have adequate space for residents who have lived there for decades to live well. And as property taxes are increasing, small businesses that give the, uh, the neighborhoods their flavor and culture are dying out. So I know I'm basically out of time here, but um, I just wanted to sum this up by coming back to voice and representation. I often wonder if one reason that South Bend neighborhoods are overlooked is because resources go where people can engage and advocate and where there are people who know how to work the system who can speak English and where there's also city councillors and influencers who reside in those neighborhoods. We currently don't have any representation on city council in the South area. But status quo is not working for South Vancouver residents. Resource allocation and distribution has bypassed this huge percentage of the population and this needs to change. So what can be done? Does the city need to change the opportunities to engage or do residents across our neighborhoods need to learn to engage better based on the systems that exist? Maybe the answer is a little bit of both. We talk a lot about how the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Well, we are doing our best as the neighborhood house to try to help people advocate and ask for more. But what if decision makers also recognize that there are barriers to participation in many of the communities across the city, including South Vancouver, and if instead of ignoring the silence, if they pursued complete communities that are equitable and anti-racist. Because there's no question, to me anyway, that there is institutional racism in the way that neighborhoods have been designed and invested in across Vancouver. We need to have a healthy city for all, not a healthy city for some. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. A little bit long, but very poignant. <laughs> that was great. Um, I think if we're, uh, it, it, certainly the, the case, um, for change is being made pretty loud and clear. We have one more panelist and it is our honored guest from Musqueam, Deborah Sparrow. Deborah asked to speak uh, last. She is coming to the conversation as an acclaimed weaver, public artist and knowledge keeper for Musqueam and is a leading figure in the revival of Musqueam weaving. Um, Deborah. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm probably coming from a different perspective than all of you, but I've been listening patiently to all of you. Um, you know, I may be all of the above that was just uh, discussed, but also I come from a community and a village that um, 
you know, has a different perspective about how uh, we look at the city, how we look at communities. Um, basically, you know, where I live, uh, this village I'm living in is called Mali, even though you know it as Musqueam. It's only one of, you know, hundreds of villages that we had throughout this territory. And thank you, Javier, for your words. And to all of you, thank you. But Javier touched my heart because he's acknowledging um, what heritage is and what history is. And that's to me, you know, so important for Vancouver. Debra, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can you just push start video, please? So that we can see you. Okay, there we go. Much better, thank you. Got it? Yeah, so, um, you know, for us here where we live, um, we feel the same um, challenges uh, about where we're going as people, as a community of First Nations who have been here since time and memorial, as you all know. And, you know, where, where do we go in our community uh, as far as, you know, housing and, we are working on many new plans now, but we're really, you know, um, we're really sort of suffocating with housing. Um, our land stretched across all of Vancouver at one time, and now we have this tiny little spot left. And sometimes when I drive along the shores of Vancouver and I look out at, you know, all of you who have come and um, are sharing this land with us now, and we look at how little land we have, I you know, it kind of breaks my heart. And um, yet I know that this is the year 2021 now we're at, and I'm wondering how far can we go? And um, all of you have, you know, those visions and those jobs to be urban planners or to, you know, try and understand where do we go from here? Do we go forward or do we sort of um, look back in time and say, you know, gee, our, commun our communal living sort of worked kind of well. Multifamily housing has worked well. Um, so, you know, can we balance? I mean, when I've been asked to come and, you know, talk with urban planners, I say, you know, regardless of how much building has to go on in this city, we still have to remember people are human and they don't want to live in a little box. And so we have to figure a way out of creating spaces that you know people can thrive in and be happy in and not be caught in high paying small little structures i mean that's my pet peeve um and you know in musqueam we're as i said we're, we're, we're facing the same thing and you know we're working hard to figure out you know how we're going to move in a different direction because our land and becoming um, smaller and smaller and you know ironically we have to buy our own land back and again when I see big signs land for sale by someone else uh, again I get kind of sad because I think wow it must be nice to be selling all our land and making good money and mm, we don't even have any to you know to to claim back so our 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 uh, concerns are different in some ways and yet as I mentioned, we do all live together here. So, you know, if we can also look at how inviting is Vancouver or is it? And that's something that you all know. I think most of you that, you know, one of my goals was to wrap the city of Vancouver. So we'll work on the outside of the buildings to uh, visually, you know, um, to have the visuals that are uh, maybe recognizable to all of us if we live in the city of Vancouver and the heritage of it and who is Vancouver and how can we um, put some beauty before ourselves as we you know look at how we we build um, the visuals in Vancouver working with the mural fest working with uh, certain now I'm actually working with some real estate and you know we're looking at how to incorporate um, the beauty of, of Vancouver and its history and its history goes beyond the 150 years it goes back in time so can we all get to a place where we don't look at each other as lesser or more but that we are all living here together and that we can offer something to find a meeting ground um, instead of looking negative and that's what I hope this work brings to everyone is a message of you know 
what COVID has done is stopped us in our tracks to say, who are we um, at home? Who are we? How do we stay um, healthy in these environments? And if we can look out the window or look down the street at our relatives, our friends, our community members uh, with that vision in place, then you know maybe that's um, where we kind of want to go. We we want to look at how can we make the city and its surrounding areas for sure. I mean, how much more can we build before we sink on this little piece of property that we're building on? I mean, I think that's a concern I always think about as well as, you know, how far can we go? Um, and yet, you know, we're, we all three tribes here in the lower mainland are courteously working always with the city of Vancouver and I never, I find that also an ironic thing because no one was willing to work with us prior to the time that we decided to make those efforts. We were just quietly living here and quietly in Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh and kind of minding our own territory. And now we have a relationship that is coming out and that we're not just acknowledged because of the land. We're not just here because we're a token friend to the city. We want to have relationships if we can offer. And yet the irony again of something is when people reach out to us and ask if we have something we can share, you know, we'll have to say, well, you know, we've assimilated quite well now. So we kind of don't have um, the same kind of living that we had prior to contact. And anyway, can we really go back? I think we can go back to some degree, but not all the way. And I guess that's where the balance comes in because we're all, as we all know and have been saying in this together, um, one heart, one mind, my friend Amanda said, um, but is it, you know, is that just, is that just a statement? And um, let's be inclusive when we have these thoughts about how we build and how we become inclusive, I think, and not just say it, um, get past, everything that's been going on and challenging us in everything that we're doing. So um, I also loved what Javier said about, I think it was Gauguin or, you know, and my grandfather must have been the same kind of fellow thinking like him when he said, know who you are and know where you come from. And, you know, I've shared that, that statement many, many, many times. And that's my grandfather's statement. He's a, he would be 120 some odd years now. And the reason I say it to all of you out there is because it's so valuable when you're thinking about building, when you're thinking about living, when you're thinking about everything that you do know. Well, that you come from here now. And so how do we, you know, how do we build that? How do we build that foundation? And I think the blankets are something that our people built from, you know, it was a foundation of who we were and who we are becoming. And so we wrap the city together. Let's do this together, not only in my blankets, but all of yours from whatever culture you come from. Doesn't matter where you come from. We all have patterns that reflect us as people. So um, if that's what I have right now to contribute to all of you, then thank you for asking me to be here and um, share just a little bit of a perspective from someone who lives in a life by the river and uh, listens to the planes go by and then to the eagles singing in the morning when we're there. So we have that balance and I actually feel, you know, very privileged still to live in my home, to live here in Musqueam and to be rooted in who I am and yeah, and share that with you. So thank you all very much, Heichka, for everyone's words listening to all of you it's important and we can you know meet each other in that in that place the balance so thank you thank, thank you, you Deborah. Deborah. okay i am uh, on those words let's uh, take a moment and reflect on where we want to take the conversation. It's one of those moments where there are so many directions where we could 
head off and we've primed the pumps in so many directions. Um, I, we have a couple of polls maybe to, to get um, to, to prime um, our participants. So Rachel, could we ask the, the, the poll question now, one of them? What are the three most important elements of a complete neighborhood? We've heard many different perspectives on this. Could we, could we ask for your input on this, please? Let's get lots of opinions. I'll give you just 15 seconds to consider your response, please. This point about completeness and um, and 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 the extent to which it does vary with inclusive with an inclusive attitude um, in the face of all the trade offs that we have to make is really uh, a challenging one, or that we feel we have to make. Okay, five more seconds to get your vote in, please. And results. Hmm. Interesting. So housing came out as the top, as the top issue, followed by neighborhood services and amenities. Yeah. Interesting. And then coming up with local shops. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Thanks. Thank you. Let's just get one more, one more poll, if we could, please, Rachel. This will be the final poll. So this one is to ask um, really out of the elements of complete neighborhoods, what elements do we need to add or improve to meet the needs of future generations? And you can select three. So here's really the, the work plan, citizens' priorities for the work plan. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I think a fair comment talking about how it's difficult to pick three, but I think, and to perhaps how there are some that spin off of others. All right, so do we have the results? Here we go. Here we go. Housing again. Housing followed by transportation. Huh. Housing even more strongly important this time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very uh, much. So, um, Andy, I think that you have a, a question to to uh, pose to all of our panelists, and I'll also ask all turn your videos on so that we can see all of you, please. Indeed. Wow, thank you. and we'll just wait a second to kind of get all our panelists up on uh, up on the digital dais. I'm going to use that. I'm going to call this the digital dais, and <laughs> it's going to be my thing. And so uh, I think as folks, uh, I think Amy is coming online. All right, fantastic. And Shirley, I hope you're there with us. Uh, and feel free, uh, panelists, to turn on your mics uh, to kind of. I think in one way kind of fit into this, um, I think panel conversation. And so I think as this kind of, as, as we've seen actually with the polls, I think that there are some really interesting dynamics in terms of the responses from the audience today. And it does go into how do we talk about trade-offs that when we talk about housing, how do we ensure that we have an element of the development of housing, but yet avoiding or, or, or dealing with the issue of displacement and gentrification, uh, much less kind of fit into these other goals of 
and it and things like transportation and support for local shops, as well as I think a an acknowledgement of the shared heritage we have to each other. And I'd like to just open up uh, any responses to the panel here. Uh, wh why don't I start? Um, one of the things I noticed in the survey is uh, transportation. And one of the things I think we need to be mindful of um, is transit because it is the lifeline of um, people and how they get around and where they live and where they have to work. Um, one of the things that we need to be mindful is that neighborhoods should not be seen as self-enclosed enclaves, right? People live in a neighborhood, they need those local services, but they may work uh, elsewhere. Um, and if you don't have that, that transit lifeline, um, it's, it's, it's really going to counter what, what livable communities are all about. In Toronto, one of the biggest challenges we have is building transit infrastructure. Some communities, their primary, um, their primary want is public transit. Some, some areas in suburban, they don't even have subway access and the bus access is, is worse. And with the pandemic and reduction of public transit lines, it's even made worse. So I think it's it's a complex situation, but that's one of the pieces I think we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess Yute, I remember a um, one of your videos talks about nightclubs and the kind of trade offs that perhaps some people's interpretation of completeness is going to be very different from others. And what what are your thoughts on that type of kind of dynamics in terms of what's complete and what is not as one person's oh, completeness is the other person's um, noise? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, I mean, I, you bring up a really good point. I, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I think I come into this whole discussion around complete communities with a bit of my own personal skepticism because, you know, I, yeah, like, you, you know, what a complete community is, uh, is different for everybody. And, you know, you mentioned a nightclubs video, like, I, it's really clear to me now that uh, nightclubs and residential areas are, are not very compatible, it seems, at least uh, historically, they haven't been. And, you know, uh, a lot of Vancouver's nightlife has suffered because we've built up, you know, family friendly condominium neighborhoods around them. And uh, they have filed noise complaint after noise complaint after noise complaint to close them down. And, you know, I, I think, uh, so to me, the, uh, the idea that a community that has everything that you could possibly need within it for all generations and all peoples and all, you know, identities simply doesn't exist. We are, you know, sort of asking, reaching for the stars here. And I think, you know, what's the compromise there is really worth talking about. Uh, you know, I've been kind of uh, uh, thinking like, you know, maybe what we should be aiming for is like what, what our idea of a complete city is, you know, uh, you know, one that includes, uh, uh, you know, a, a variety of different types of neighborhoods for different types of people. Uh, uh, and, and not just like, like living neighborhoods, like, like the city's losing a lot of industrial space too. Like we barely have any of that left over. Uh, that's not necessarily a neighborhood people want to live in, but it's a type of land use that, you know, uh, a, a city desperately needs, especially as we, you know, bring in things like Amazon warehouses and whatnot. Anyways, there's my little rant about that. <laughs> but, but, but of course, I think the paradox of this is, you know, the, the, the challenges that you've identified in talking um, certainly about zoning, that mm. was indeed why zoning emerged as a device to prevent these types of incompatibilities. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm full of contradictions. It seems. <laughs> I, but complexities. Yeah, com it's it's so it's, it's certainly complex. I mean, I think um, uh, uh, one way to think about this for me is like sort of who, like when we're uh, changing our neighborhoods and when we're you know redeveloping and you know like it's. I think the question of displacement and who has the most to lose in these discussions is really important to pay attention to. Uh, you know, I think if there's development happening in a single family, you know, neighborhood where everyone owns their houses, uh, that development will actually make a lot of those people very, very rich and it will be good for them in some ways. Uh, if that development happens in a, uh, a neighborhood that, is, uh, that has a high density of renter, uh, rented households uh, that has uses that would be displaced that you know don't own the land beneath them uh, that is I, I think that that's worth paying attention to right like who has the most to gain and the most to lose when 
we're changing our city. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, I don't want to geek out too hard, but there's a map that a, a friend of mine made. Uh, I'll just post it in the, the, the comments here, but it kind of makes the case for, you know, a, a way to change our, our, our city uh, based off of, you know, minimizing displacement as much as possible. So, so maybe I'll do that. <laughs> Um, Shirley, I think uh, you wanted to chime in. Yeah, I, I really want to talk a little bit about, you know, Deborah talked about villages and I've always said I lived in a village because I live in a village within the city right. and I've always lived in a village, whether it was living in Strathcona next to Chinatown, whether it's Kitsilano, everything is within walking distance. I don't need a car. Um, and today with the pandemic showing us that we don't even have to get to work anymore, we can actually just hook in by Zoom or, 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 or use technology. Um, so the, the argument for the roads and the infrastructure for transportation is probably not as significant. My biggest problem is our failure, our miserable failure to take care of the most vulnerable in our city. They shouldn't be left on the streets. They shouldn't be out there with nowhere to go and no place to go and no shelter. Um, it's, it's unconscionable. And, and there's, you know, these people need a lot more support. If we're a good village, we take care of the ones who are vulnerable. We take care of, so that people, we have a diversity of people. We've got, you know, we've got a place for, for seniors like me. We've got place for the vulnerable. We've got places for young families, um, you know, so that you've got the services that we need. And, and I think we ha can have a diversity of villages within the city. You know, they're not all the same. They can all be different. And uh, we know that people gather around retail and gather around, or they create the retail maybe when they go there, when they live there at, in neighborhoods. And so um, I see the loss of retail on West 10th as part of our problem where, where the commodification, or if you want the trophy properties that are being owned by foreign buyers and foreign owners have destroyed the neighborhood because they don't shop in the area. And so that's another problem, right? So anyway, that's um, that's where I'm coming from. We need to take care of our most vulnerable and we need to go back to a village concept for how our city serves our population in a way that you can walk there and you can, It's that would be more sustainable in my view. Thank you, thank you, Shirley. And, and Deborah, I know reading in your biography that uh, you talked about how you would not stop until the city, until you saw that the city of Vancouver would be swathed in a Coast Salish, in a, in a Coast Salish patterns. And that this, that this is a part of, of, of perhaps a, a lifetime goal of, 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 of incorporating the historic weavings in, 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 into the city of Vancouver. And I can't help but th think about how that's connected towards the kind of idea of urban fabric and that's something that uh, w that that planners often talk about, but yet I think this pr this pronounced challenge in terms of having that touch to Coast Salish patterns that and the, and, the, and the question of a village that I wonder um, what are your thoughts towards that type of community? Well, thank you for uh, you know bringing that up once again, and uh, you know. Here I go with my quotes that I borrow off my lovely friend, the late Maya Angelou, who said, we're as much alike as we are different. So, you know, let's celebrate both of them. Can we do that? Can we celebrate how we're alike and that we all want a relatively good job? We want uh, our food and to be taken care of. And then to remember that we cannot survive without our earth and our water and our air. And so that needs to be incorporated and thought into which it is uh, into our everyday lives now. So yeah, walking in our neighborhoods or growing our own food is where we're having to go right now. In fact, you know, here in Musqueam, we're, we're really looking at that. And also, you know, our food sources, but at the same time, you know, looking after the environment, our salmon is depleted. Um, people are, you know, are we really paying attention? Did COVID stop us in our tracks so we can evaluate this and say, oh my God, when a plane doesn't fly and I can't go anywhere, um, when I can't drive to the next province or I, you know, I can't do anything except for stay still, I can grow some food. I can actually come back to who I really am and 
our differences are that maybe we eat different food and we speak a different language and you speak of little villages and communities. And, you know, I grew up here in Carisdale and Dunbar and, you know, when I go to Carisdale, I don't really recognize it anymore. And if I don't speak a different language other than English, I might not communicate with somebody. And I, you know, I hear what Zara, Zara is saying and yet, um, you know, <sighs> It's so difficult because you get attacked for not speaking a certain language or, you know, if you speak your own tongue, then people say speak English. And if you speak English, they say, you know, you can't come in here because you don't speak my language. This has happened to us. Mm -hmm. This has happened to our people time and time again in our own neighborhood. And, um, and yet, you know, we pers persevere um, and we keep moving towards, you know, wrapping the city and, you know, the end result for blanketing the city is not just an individual uh, focus. What it is, is looking at patterns as inclusive to all cultures so you feel invited to your own city in heritage. Because every one of us are weavers and every one of us have patterns that are, you know, ref uh, recognizable. So now when someone sees a pattern in the city, they say, oh, I saw your work somewhere. And I'm like, that's not my work. But they recognize it because they've seen it now and they you know we can claim this in vancouver to be our part of our identity and it's beautiful and it and it's i i just think it it brings that um you know it brings that wrapping who we are together deborah i think that one of the i i see your hand there javier and i'm going to turn to you in a sec one of the really inspiring in your statements in particular and, and across the panel too. And I'm seeing this in some of the questions that we've got um, bubbling in the, in the Q&A and then in the chat is this tension between what we can achieve in terms of completeness in our own villages or in whatever those communities are that we recognize as being familiar to us, uh, representing our own pattern, as you say, and then what we look to the city as a whole for in terms of introducing the the delight, the diversity, um, the ability to complete our lives um, through that balance as well. Um, Javier, what, what, what are your thoughts about how to connect the small scale of the neighborhood and its recognizability over time with the, the diversity of needs of a, of a complete and diverse city? Um, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> I'm going to answer it in a different way. Just because it's something that I think is really important that has not been mentioned uh, around the idea of why we're even talking about a complete community here. And in my mind is because we've experienced a number of changes, social changes, changes in urban fabrics, changes in the way that we live, that we now have a bad fit, or at least we feel we have a bad fit between where we live and, and what we actually want to achieve. But I think that, you know, this is, you know, we're, 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 we're doing things that other people already did, right? We're being faced with these outdated regulations to regulate structures, but don't forget those people were not doing it out of malice. They were doing it because they thought it was the best solution to their problems at the time. And so, you know, you know they were doing exactly the same thing. And, and once we ask ourselves, you know, when faced, you know, what these outdated regulations and structures that don't allow certain buildings or whatever is going on, you know, what are, why are we regulating this? Who are we regulating? And I think at the end of the day, it comes down that we're regulating the free market. You know, we're in this position where we've internalized these neoliberal ideas to the point that, oh, it's the free market and housing makes you rich and all this stuff. And free market doesn't equate with community and stands probably opposed to the idea of a complete community. And I think that some of the things that Deborah was saying that I thought were quite interesting. I think that we must realize there's things like the, you know, the MST is doing this incredibly radical thing uh, by recreating a public commons, but not, by not selling their land, they're gonna be able to in 50 years say we're doing something else. They don't have to talk to 10,000 property owners to do anything. They will be able as a community to make decisions on the public good that we can't make because we've given over to this idea of the free market. And I think this idea of the Coast Salish village and all these things that come up, I mean, they're taking it seriously by keeping the land. And, and, you know, and so there's a number of things in there for creating a complete community that we must realize that, you know, 
as we have this discussion that we will be having a different discussion in 10 years or 30 years or whatever it is, because there'll be some other kind of things. And I think one of the biggest impediments that we have to creating that social change is this idea of, of the free market. I don't know how we ever get out of it, but you know, there's one of the things that I would say, you know, city of Vancouver, stop selling any land that you have, right? Use it for public good, make sure that you can do that. I don't think it's one or the other, but I think this is an important thing in any conception of the, com of the complete community, complete neighborhoods is, is that community. I was quite disheartened to see that in both polls, the idea of, of you know, social connection with your neighbors was quite far down the way. It's like, I want amenities. I don't want a community is what I saw in that poll, right? I don't really care who my neighbor is. It doesn't matter to me. And to me, if in a complete community, I actually feel like I am part of the community. I actually feel that I belong. I feel that my voice maybe is heard. It's not like, oh, well, I can shop, have a coffee and go shopping and then come back to my house. And that again is, is this whole idea of, of the market. And I think that that's, for me, it's been the elephant in the room that's kind of come up as we've discussed all these things. Amy, I wanna give you a chance to get in on that if you wanna, if you wanna add your comment on, on that. Uh that ultimatum that Javier has just laid down? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I guess we've often asked the city to use its uh, resources, pol policies, land to, to try some things. You know, a lot of the chat and the Q&A was around what's possible. Like, what can we do now? What are the policies that we need to enact? How do we deal with regulation? And you know, the city owns a lot of property. They could try some things with uh, with their own real estate and retail spaces. And you know, the what I hear from people trying to rent those retail spaces is that there's like a disconnect between, you know, policy and planning and city council and then the real estate division, which is just trying to maximize profit. And uh, and so I think that that you know that's that's something that that, that the city could do. Um, I, you know, the free market, I don't really want to get into comments on, on the free market, but I do think that the, you know, the need for housing and affordable housing and the need for affordable commercial real estate should, you know, be thought of together. It shouldn't be an afterthought what goes on the commercial space that we should think about what kinds of uh, services and, and products and jobs and money flow will be created by a commercial space that goes under, uh, you know, affordable housing. Many places in the U.S. are looking at this. Boulder is looking at like, okay, we have to actually look at our affordable housing and have affordable commercial real estate that, that are one and the same because, that kind of, um, you know, tunnel vision gets us into trouble when we then just want to maximize the, the rents that we can get on the ground floor so that uh, we can subsidize the affordable housing above. I think that, you know, it's short sighted to do that. Thank you. Zara, we're getting close to the end and I'm not sure that you've had a chance to put your, your final thoughts in. Yeah, there's lots of lots of thoughts. Uh, Javier, thanks for raising the point about social connection. I think uh, working at a neighborhood house or two, two neighborhood houses, social connection is our business. That's what we're meant to do. And I think that's why um, the points about infrastructure are so, so important because to have a complete community or a neighborhood, you need to have places for people to get together. You know, we've tried doing outdoor programming in areas where there's no community center, no neighborhood house or no family place. It works for a few months out of the year. The rest of the time, people do retreat into their home because they don't have anywhere to go to have a chat or get to know their neighbor because that's actually not, it doesn't seem to be the way that our communities are set up. There aren't natural places for people to connect without those amenities being there. So, you know, in my opinion, um, I like that village concept and different people can define that in different ways. What's the most important is that people see pride in where they live, that they feel a connection to where they live, whether it has nightclubs or doesn't have nightclubs. If they can stay where they live on a map, tell you what it's called and what defines it, then we might have be moving towards a complete neighborhood. I know that that's certainly not the case in the South side where people really, there's no recognition of the neighborhoods even for the people who live there. And that to me is a big, big problem. Um, one other point that I wanted to make if I have one more minute here, about how to keep young people in the city. 
Um, I know I lived in Toronto actually for about five years and it's working there. My husband and I were able to get a one bedroom apartment where there were a lot of high rises that had all apartments. And um, we were able to save up money so that we could enter the real estate market because our rent was $800 a month and we were a double income family. That option is not on the table in Vancouver. I don't think that it exists. There isn't um, a chance for young people to build up a bit of a nest egg so that they can even dream of getting into the, the, the housing market or renting a place that they like in Vancouver. You know, so I think um, focusing not just on rental apartments, which I'm seeing more and more coming on the market, but affordable rental apartments for young people to stay in the city because it's not gonna be a great thing. I've got a six year old, you know, if she grows up with like 10 other young people around her, that's not gonna be a good childhood. So anyway, I just, uh, yeah, I wanted to share those thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are uh, a wealth of questions, pointed comments, specific items to address in terms of the city of Vancouver's uh, approach, including new plans for neighborhood businesses, for electrical outlets reaching across sidewalks to some of the biggest issues that we face in terms of reconciliation and, and equity uh, concern for adequate concern for uh, for the integrity of neighborhoods. So there's a lot that, that I want to thank the panelists for putting on the table tonight. And I want to thank our participants for following so attentively. Um, Andy, do you want to, does anything stand out that you wanted to add? You have to unmute yourself. The bane of the 20, 2021. Um, I would like to again thank you, um, thank you, the panelists. Uh, special thanks to the panelists for uh, participating in this uh, in this conversation about complete neighborhoods. And I think that it's important to note that this is uh, only the beginning. And I think that part of this is to ensure that there is a not only a that there is an accountability perhaps in the topics that we've talked about today on the city of Vancouver as it develops uh, its the, the citywide plan and that this engagement is continued and I think it, as well as to forget as, as well as well to remember who isn't at this table and to re, and to I think constantly be aware of who isn't at the table and to extend that table um, I like to thank the city of Vancouver for um, for for sponsoring this event, and thank everyone and for the city coming. Also, just the, just today has has launched shapeyourcity.ca. You can see it in the chat box um, where there are more opportunities. You can look up complete neighborhoods, and um, they are trying to roll out some COVID safe um, friendly activities, uh, including self guided tours, neighborhood asset mapping. Um, the, they have their conversation kits program in order to uh, another way to get your your voice heard and to just spend more time thinking this issue through with all of us uh, half of our city. We also have coming events. We've got the city of economic health. I think that uh, everyone present today will be intrigued by the way we are going to be considering the economy. Um, February 25th, that event's going to be in the morning. There will be data. Data I, will be presented. Data, there, data will be presented. <laughs> and data related to uh, two complete communities. So um, come on up, uh, I'll bring up the digital coffee. And then March 4th will be another event. Uh, we didn't get to really talk about some of the important ecosystem uh, connection questions that were raised tonight, but that, that event, Reimagining the Public Realm, will really uh, open up that conversation as well. Thank you. Thank you to all of the staff members from the city and from SFU for helping out, for making this event as smooth as it could be, given our distance from one another. Um, we're going to leave our Padlet idea boards open for 30 more minutes. So please do spend a few minutes um, just kicking out a few more ideas, big or small questions. Everything is welcome. Um, Can I say something? Please. I just want to thank you all again for uh, this evening, but I also want to, to thank council, city council, because I do know a few of them, not all of them. and. I am uh, happy that they're open and that they have these discussions and I'm 
we just want to say thank you to them because I think that the city of Vancouver is one of the cities in Canada who is working towards multiculturalism. I just have to say it. And it might not be feel that way to some people, but when I look across Canada, I see this as taking the lead in at least making those efforts and being inclusive in the small steps we're taking. So thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Good night. <laughs>